When I was a young boy, my father said to me, Put this scarf around your neck and sing the blues with me. And now I am much older, there's a place I want to be. It's red faucet, it's beautiful, it's steeped in history. And I know what I'll find when the place comes alive. I got that battle fever coming over me. And I got butterflies and hurricanes shaking my body. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, here with Mr. Jamie Mulgrew, Lymphy Captain. Um, hi Jamie, how are we doing? How's it going? Okay. I'm good, I'm good. Thanks, how are you? Yes, fine. Good, um, thanks very thanks much for, for well thanks for joining us. Uh, it's always dead distracting with that song because it's a, it's a cracking song and it was actually written by, uh, or it was not one written by, but it was signed by a band called St. Phoenix. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, cracking band actually, from Scotland. Actually, she's on it there to see, but it didn't come up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, I'll send you a wee link with the video with the with the actual song. And it's a brilliant. And some Phoenix are a, uh, two boys, massive Rangers fans, and um, good friends of the show, and they're on all the time. So uh, cracking song, some brilliant stuff as well. Um, can also give a quick shout out to our sponsors, G4 Claims, um, and also KGM Printing, obviously for the support and help throughout the show. And everything they do for us and obviously we're going to grab a wee chat jamie just a wee bit about you and about your career and obviously um about what you're doing now and obviously your your love of rangers that's why you're here it's a rangers podcast so um yeah just if you want to give us a wee quick sort of um breakdown or, or view of where how you started where your career started and i know you started at st andrews am i right we were talking about that earlier yeah. but just a wee bit about maybe even how you got started in football yourself i probably like everyone George, whenever they were growing up all, you know, years ago, I was all about playing for the BB, the Boys Brigade. Mm -hmm. um, not so much now around the whole of, <clears throat> around the whole of UK, really. There's so many opportunities to play for boys clubs and, and, and different clubs back then. Certainly whenever I was growing up, eight, nine years of age, it was playing for the BB on a Saturday morning. Um had the opportunity to actually, you know, go to St Andrews, which obviously, again back then had a had a massive affiliation with Rangers, um, mm. and actually just stayed on and, and, and played for the BB. Um, then played played uh, for a few years for a team in Hollywood, um, Hollywood Boys. I played for them, and then ended up going on to St Andrews then again, and. Um, Obviously, learnt the trade there with the coaches that we had there, and obviously Joe Kincaid, who mm. who was responsible for St Andrews, and and probably for a long period of time, George was responsible for uh, the success of of the Northern Ireland national team. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Probably people aren't sort of familiar with that or, or know that, but um, certainly here in Northern Ireland that. Joe Kincaid was was responsible for a lot of a lot of uh, top players, whether it was in our league in the Irish League or or Scotland, England, um, and and there was at a period of time there was many of them involved in in the Northern Ireland national team. Mm. Um, Steve Davis is probably a major one who obviously came through St Andrews. Um, Chris Brunt as well was another obviously big hit. Um, so yeah, so look. Massive, obviously, you know, Joe had a, a, a massive um, influence in, on my career and certainly many, many others. And I think, yes, he was a massive influence, obviously, on our own football careers. But I think he, as a growing up as a person, um, which is obviously very important as well, that he was a massive influence um, on that and how to behave and how to respect people. And yeah. again, look, we were in the heart of, heart of, you know, 
off the West Circular Road, Heart of Shankle. Mm. Um, but yet we had players coming from from everywhere, and um, as as I say, we we knew how to behave and act, um, and obviously play football as well. And we've we, most of us have still kept in contact with quite a number of people, and we still carry those traits along with us. Yeah, brilliant. No, I, I mean from 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 my own experience, they were always synonymous with producing talent. And we had spoke obviously earlier about some of the some of the guys even that came before you and some of the boys that had obviously gone up over to Rangers. And there was a bit of a conveyor belt almost at that time of, of players yeah. going over and John Morrow, John Douglas, Paul McKnight, um, you know, the name but a few. But obviously those guys that, that maybe through injury or whatever didn't necessarily hit the heights, but um, it was still recognised as, as a fantastic young lads football football team, and obviously the, the the opportunity to move on. But for yourself, then you you then obviously I, I believe you started off at the Glens first of all, Glen Torn, and then. But how did the opportunity then come about? Then did they join Linfield, Jimmy? How did that happen? Well, we uh, I joined. I've always looked, supported Linfield. Um, I've done growing up in family are from the Shankill, um, and obviously you know that's. That's who you should support if you're from up <laughs> in that direction. Um, yeah. And look, the St Andrews team that I was involved in, we were finishing, and I was involved in Northern Ireland setups at the time, so I needed to play football for somebody. Mm. And I had a lot of friends at Glen Torn, so the opportunity opportunity came to play there. We went and played in a competition called the Foil Cup up in London there. Yeah, yeah. And, and we... Um, Went and played, enjoyed it, and just thought that you know there was no point moving because enjoyed it and knew the boys, knew the coaches, and felt comfortable there. Hmm. Um, then it got till it was about eighteen. Was playing in the reserves, um, and we had a double header against Linfield, and playing in the reserves, and must have done well because after the second game, um, Linfield had. had said would, would I be interested um, which obviously it was and it came to the end of that season and I wasn't really getting a feeling that I was going to get an opportunity at Glen Torn mm. and I spoke to David Jeffrey and and he made you feel wanted and, and, and all yeah. those things and it just felt right to be honest with you and I thought you know supported Limfield you know give it the best shot and if it doesn't work out, then I've tried it. Um, so, yeah, so the rest is history, really. The rest is history. 600 games later, I believe. 600 odd games later. <laughs> so, not, not too bad. Yeah, so no, joined, joined there when I was just when I was 19. Um, part of the first team squad, going straight in. And Excellent. It was, it was a wee bit, um, wee bit daunting, George, just with. Um, Obviously, the big characters and then the, mm. and the the big legends that that were obviously there at the time. Um, but look, it taught me so much, and I learned very very quickly. Um, and as I say, look, I've continued again to to carry on the things that I learned from from all those boys, from all those men um, that I still carry with me. As I say, still to this day now. Um, yeah, absolutely, and look. You know, if you can't learn off them boys, then you know you, you you'll never learn. So tell me, who was your when you were growing up? Obviously, you said you were you were a Lemfy fan, but who was your sort of boyhood boyhood idol? Who who did you sort of mirror your game on? Do you know the way when we're all growing up, when we're playing in the street, we all would, you know, you want to be McCoist or a Gascoigne or whatever. You wanted to be whatever player, and you every time you scored a goal, you called it the name of that person. So who was yours? Mine was mine was Barry Ferguson, George. Um, <laughs> So, look, centre midfielder as as I right. am, um, just loved um, everything about him. Just you know, again, you know, being so young to the captain, captain and such a mm. again such a, a good side then. Um, and look, obviously, Dick Advocat came into the club at the time and was changing everything about Rangers really. Mm. Um, and for obviously. Look, a coach and a manager like Dick Advocat, they look at Barry Ferguson like that. Um, I think that shows everybody how special he really was. Um, yeah. And obviously at that time, how you know how special he was really going to be. Um, and as I say, look, he was 
I always the guy who who doesn't love Valley McCoy's really, George. Uh, <laughs> I still I still watch even it was the, the very first lockdown we had. Um always grew up watching the one to nine in a row. Yeah, um box sets. Yeah. Have them and um, actually stuck them on YouTube and watched them consecutively over a period of time. And you just it's it's a great it's a great uh, the, good, the good old days. Look back you to one. Yeah. Um, you were talking even about Barry Ferguson there. I remember actually the first time I seen him playing myself was over here, believe it or not, and playing against Crusaders in a friendly. And um they, they they sent them over and I think they were playing the blues a couple of weeks later, but it was a mix of the first team and the second team. And when they say players stand head and shoulders above everybody else, he literally did. Not big in stature, um, but literally. And for me, he played the game with his head up. Every he never looked down at the ball, and he knew he instantly, and he just controlled the game. And it was it was a packed sea view, and, and he literally run the show from start to finish. And it was brilliant. He was absolutely phenomenal back then. And like you say, to step into that team at such a young age, um, and, and at a very young age, obviously. You know, and, and the lead that team was phenomenal. But you became what age did you become captain then, Jimmy of Limfy? Um, I think I was about I think it was twenty nine, George. Right. Twenty nine. And you so, you learned off your captains, I believe, would have been what Noel Bailey, the likes of those boys. So yeah, it would have been yeah. Noel Bailey sort of for a long period of time, and then Michael Gold would have been then, um, mm. for for a longer period as well. Um, but I think even just like George, you know, with Football's obviously changed now from 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 back then, and it's you know. But I think I think what makes top players as well is their whole mindset of, of the game and and their whole mindset. Um, and certainly, whenever even now you hear Barry Ferguson talk about whenever he played for Rangers and the squads that he was involved in at Rangers, just their whole mindset and their mentality was was ruthless, really, and was yeah. Yeah, that will the wind set them apart. And again, yeah, I don't yeah, think for, uh, and I don't know. think I think football's changed. I'm not really sure whether there's many people like that now that have that ruthless mentality and have that mm. that mindset. Um, and I suppose, look, whenever you're at Rangers, um, you know, you have that. You have to have that siege mentality. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think. Obviously, on a far smaller scale, um, with us at Limfield, uh, I think you have to learn very, very quickly that you know that you're you're hated really, and you have to have yeah. that seed mentality. Look, Rangers is the same. You see what's going on over the the the, the number of years now. Um, I think it's there for everybody to see, and the thing you know, as I say, whenever you come in that door and you know you pull on the jersey, you you know everyone's out to beat you. Everyone's Wants wants to beat you and put you down or whatever it is, and as I say the mindset you know of of those boys back then was was ruthless and it was a mentality that was needed and and is needed even still yeah. to this day. Well, obviously there's 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 very there's very very similar parallels between the two teams, and like you say, maybe on a smaller scale, but there's still that level of expectation. There's still that level of of stress that comes with that. Um, and obviously both teams this season celebrated their 55th title. What, what was that like, Jimmy? What was it like? To, uh, was, was it as big as, say, for, for Rangers fans? Because for, for, for all Rangers fans, the 55th title, you know, after such a long time uh, was, was, was extra special. But obviously for, for Linfield, who have could have continued success throughout that time, was that 55th title, uh, you know, was it, as, what is this, was it as sweet as, say, I think I think obviously to reach fifty five the same as Rangers George yes was was really special and good but I think on, on our own part and our within our own club um, you know obviously you have clubs you know spend a lot of money and and, and whatever else in the league's getting more competitive um, and a lot a lot better really um, but each each year you you win the league and. It's the hardest, um, yeah, yeah. and look, this season coming up, it'll be the hardest again, and it and it'll probably feel like the best one. Mm. Um, and I think obviously, George, look with the with the whole pandemic and the 
the, the difficulty of that. Um, just having to change your whole training regime, really. Um, mm. And obviously the, the mindset changes off, you know, you don't have a crowd there to, 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 to cheer you on and, and to push you on. Yeah. Um, and look, sometimes, you know, you have the crowd there and people say that it works against you and whatever else. But I think sometimes, George, whenever you get that bit of criticism and that, you know, those voices from the stand shouting and maybe criticizing whatever, I think that that has to work as a motivator as well. Um, yeah. I think it's important that, you know, obviously at the minute you hear the press and people saying about Rangers, they can't, you know, the players, they can't play in front of a, a big crowd and, and, and whatever else. But, you know, I think, you know, whenever you're playing in front of a big crowd, it's something that you embrace um, and that you enjoy. Again, on a smaller scale, on a far, far smaller scale, that, you know, we would get, you know, a decent crowd at our matches. Um, mm. And obviously, you do hear the voices and you can't hear them very clearly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know it's whether it's me you know what are you doing or blah or whatever it is but yeah, yeah. again I think that's something that it sharpens you up and gives you a week maybe kick up the backside that extra bit of motivation that you know to push on and to drive on and I think as I say it's something that I think it's something that you've got to embrace I think yeah. we've, you know for, for a year and I we you know we played with no crowds and we've all said and everybody says that Football is not the same without supporters. Mm. Um, so you know, as I say, I think it's something that you got to embrace and and enjoy that sort of that pressure. I don't know if you want to yeah. call it that. No, um, well, it is that pressure, isn't it, Jimmy? It is, and again, that, 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 yeah. it's, look, it's 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 something that certainly us at Limfield, you know, as I say, so at home matches against the good team, you know, it was Glen Torn at home. You could be talking eight to ten thousand or whatever, and. Mm. Um, What's their, what's their not the embrace? What's their not the enjoy? Yeah. Um, and you talked earlier again, about the mindset, didn't talks. you? Yeah. You yeah, spoke about that mindset. That you need that You need that motivator, don't yeah. you? You need that pressure to motivate. And if you're a good yeah. player, if you're a top player and you've got that hunger and you've got that desire, that's the type of stuff that will drive you on. That is the type of pressure I mean, that you need. Who doesn't want to go out in front of it? That would be something that... Uh, that me and you and everybody else would dream of having that opportunity, George, exactly. of going out at Ibrox yeah. or Five Rice and, yeah. and playing for Rangers. You know, it's something that you got to enjoy and embrace. Um, we, a number of years ago, we went to Celtic Park and played in front of basically a full house. Mm. Um, and how was that? I was going to ask you that. How was that for you? As obviously, as a, I mean, as a, as a massive Rangers fan yourself, good representing Linfield, captain and Linfield in the Champions League qualifier against Celtic. What was that like? What was that to come up against those types of players who maybe you see on TV yeah. from afar? Yeah. How did you feel? How did you even feel that you you you, you sort of competed as well? If they were Celtic like Rangers now, um, or minds ahead of, of what we are, George. Um, mm. But again, it was a tie that we expected to win. And again, it was something that we, you know, us as players part-time back then, you know, going and playing against a team like Celtic at a full house. You know, it's something that, that we, well, certainly probably I won't experience again. So again, you got to embrace that and, and enjoy that and take every moment then. Um, it was it was incredible. The atmosphere was was fantastic. It really was was brilliant. Um and I do have to say that Brendan Rogers was was fantastic. Um, yeah. Really was really gentleman's man, gentleman. Um, wouldn't have said a lot of their players would have been. Um, right. Just they were different. So it would have gave you the impression that it was Celtic Rangers in a way, George. Yeah. If you want yeah. to say, um, mm. uh, you know. And getting Scott Brown's shirt, but it wasn't. And it wasn't. <laughs> wasn't reciprocated. <laughs> it wasn't a nice atmosphere. <laughs> um, but was, hey, Brandon Rogers was brilliant. Um, and again, it was a brilliant, brilliant experience. And mm. again, that's what you play football for. That's what yeah. you're involved in for experiences and for memories like that. So Jimmy, you've gone you've gone from part time obviously quite recently to full time. I, I I know I know obviously in yeah. terms of training, obviously things are different, but 
what does a typical day look, look like for you now? What is what is a normal Jamie Mulgrew day like now? Um, well, whenever we were part time, George, we would have trained still three nights a week, so it was still you know, it was still intense enough. So we were training mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then we then the match on a Saturday. Um, but it's pretty full on, pretty hectic, you know, and. Because all the boys, you know, have jobs and whatever, and then you're rushing to get the training, and mm. you know, at the, certainly at them field, our training would be would be very intense. Um, yeah. You know, f for the level that we're at, we it, it is very intense, and you know, then you're getting home in the bed and then up for work again. Yeah, um, yeah. So some boys that are working. You know, jobs. It would be very physical. It is very demanding, and mm. Glenfield is a very demanding environment. But you know, now you know we start. We're in for about half nine, George. You're getting your breakfast, and it's a proper full time environment. Um, yeah. You know, getting your breakfast, then in the gym doing our warm up stuff, stretching, seeing the physio, all the prehab stuff, and then you know out on the pitch do a training session. And then after a session, then it's either a gym session and then our lunch, or if it's not gym session, then you do whatever you, you know, whether you want to just do your own gym stuff or do whatever mm -hmm. it is, and then your lunch. Then we're usually leaving there, George, for one half one. Um I do some coaching and stuff. So on an, in an ideal world without coronavirus, whenever I'd be coaching around schools and, and doing that, then you know, I would go on and do an hour's coaching, maybe from three to four in a school. Yeah. And yeah. then nighttime, nighttime then we're free. And so far since we started back, George, it's been really, really good. Really, I find it very beneficial anyway, certainly for me, for for my own life, um, with having two youngsters, another one in the mm -hmm. way. And just means that you know, my nights are free now to, to have a bit of family time um, and more to recover then for the next day's yeah. training session or whether it's the, the recover then for for the match. Um, and again, you're getting the bed at a reasonable hour. Um, sometimes I wouldn't, if we were part-time, George, I would maybe get into, in from training to half nine, yeah. getting something to eat. And by the time, you wind, wind down, by the time you wind down, yeah. Yeah, it's maybe 11 o'clock then, George. Mm. And then... You know, then I would be up, say, for example, maybe anywhere from six to six o'clock to seven o'clock in the morning then with a with the kids yeah, and stuff. Yeah. So again, it's yeah. So again, you know, being the full time now, you're free at night. You're getting to bed, plenty the rest, mm. um, being ready to to get into training the next day. So would you say with 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 obviously David Healy coming in and then obviously the change from part time into full time, the culture has changed a wee bit more now. Do you think you know? Because I know a lot of boys and in, in recently from the Irish League have actually gone over the water and have, have started to become a wee bit more successful. And I think in terms of, of of our own league over here, we are getting a wee bit more recognised and people are making that step up. For yourself though, do you feel like the culture's changing slightly now that the, that the, the things are moving into a more professional era? Yeah, I think George, um, the league and the, and the quality of the league and the money in the European competitions now um, have dictated that. Certainly with Lauren going full time and stuff, then teams and clubs, you know, don't want to fall behind. Um, mm. Obviously, them feel of their own model, um, their own step and and, and model um, that they have. Um, and the game, <clears throat> I think the the full time model can can only benefit us, George. Yeah. To be honest with you, um, already already think it has. Um, again, boys not having to come into training after a day's work or after training, then the next day getting in, in the work and then training again. So it's that whole cycle. Yes, and um, I think that's just you know so beneficial already. Um, not having to go and do a day's work and then go to training. Mm. Um, and again, I think George, you see now that our league's becoming a bit more credible in the sense where, as you said, players are leaving our league now to go across the water and and, and not just spend them maybe one and a half two years, but they're they're actually 
holding their own and um, yeah. making a name for themselves. Um, you know, we've obviously been able to, players have left us over the past few years and went across the water and, and, and making a really good living and doing really well for themselves. Mm. Um, and again, that's that's all down to the culture that we have at Linfield as well. Um, you know, for, to give them a platform to to be able to do that and obviously to make a success of it. Yeah. So, Jimmy, obviously, going back to a wee bit about yourself, we, we, we'd said there earlier that you've, you've now 600 odd games for Linfield, you've won nine league titles on your own yourself, but there was a stage um, around about 10 years ago where you, you were sort of, you went on trial a wee bit, I think you went to Portland Timbers, and you were, I think you were at yeah. that age in your mid-twenties where you were sort of going, is this going to become a full-time career, is this going to be my job, or so how was that experience then? I think you were linked with some Scottish teams as well, like the Kilmarnock kids, I think we were after you, so... Was there never an opportunity yeah. there? What, what was that like? What was that experience like? No, look, the experience of going to America, George, was great. Um, I had a few family friends over there who had, you know, contacts of, of, of you know, getting me in and, and training with, it, with a few teams. Um, mm -hmm. We were actually full-time at Linfield at that time. Well, full-time, there was only, I think it was about eight of us or so, George. Um mm -hmm. So it wasn't proper full time, but you know we were classed as full time. Yeah, but yeah. that was coming to an end. Then feel we're stopping that, and I enjoyed the whole full time aspect. And for me to try and maybe continue that on, um, an opportunity came up of of going out to America and sort of training with a few teams and things. Um, went to Columbus Crew, spent uh, five days there. Then I went to Portland Timbers and, and spent, a, a, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks there. I ended up spending a month there because the family friends, that's where they live. So stayed with them anyway and, and trained with the, with, the, with the first team at the Timbers. Uh, John Spencer was the manager actually. Yes, then. yes. Ex-Rangers player, Chelsea as well. Yeah, so he was there. Um, good, I, I, I liked him. He was... Old school, if you want to say, George, mm. um, which maybe didn't particularly suit some of those Americans. Um, but I had a pretty vocal, strong voice, um, which again, I was used to and I, I had no issues with that. But mm. he, I don't think he lasted that long, which maybe that's why, I don't know. But yeah. he was good. I liked him. A couple of, some really good conversations with him and things. But... It didn't particularly work out um, and then went on to then Orlando and, and was with them. Um, oh, Ex-Everton ex striker was there. Adrian Heath. Adrian Heath, was he? So he was managing, was he? Yeah, he was a manager. He's a manager there. He's, man he's actually managing Minnesota United now. Right, but he was brilliant. He was really good, good guy. And um, they had links to Stoke City at the time. Um, but anyway, played with them and played a friend against Bolton. And they wanted me to stay longer. George, their season was ending whenever I went, so yeah. they wanted me to stay longer. But it got to the stage where Linfield basically wanted an answer from me. Mm. Um. Orlando wanted me to stay another week and sort of said that there was a good chance that, you know, I could get a contract, but there was nothing really concrete and I was didn't want to take that chance, to be honest yeah, with you. So yeah. I ended up just going back and, and, and signing for Linfield. Um, and look, I can regret that decision because obviously everything's worked out brilliantly and Absolutely. really well. Um, look, obviously, you know, that lifestyle of over there and, and, if I got something, then what would have happened? But look, you know, I've been so happy with with being at Linfield and, and everything that that yeah. has happened over that period of time. I wouldn't and Jimmy, have, have any regrets. Yeah, and about I think it was 2015. You, you're you're obviously your testimonial committee came together and you got the opportunity to play against Rangers. And I think it would have been Mark Warburton's team then, would it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, George, so that was that was 20. 17 was my match, oh, September okay. 2017. But now we would have started up that committee like 2016, George. Yeah, so it would yeah. have been roughly. Um, 
I think it was 2017. Do you know what? It's just time that goes by. So time much. flies. <laughs> well, when you've been winning as many league times as you, it obviously does. <laughs> but we, um, look, I had, a, I had a committee there, George, that were just fantastic, just great men. Um, coming to meetings and just voluntarily, George, just guys who just love Linfield and um, were just willing to give up their time to be on my committee, really. Um, mm. And, you know, forever grateful for, for everything that they've done for me. But so the very, very first meeting we had, we met in... We met in the... We had one of our meetings in the Shankill Rangers, George, and then the rest of our meetings would have been in the Barton Club off the Donegal Road. Right. Which is a wee Rangers club as well. Mm. Uh, it's a Limpy club as well, George. So our meetings would have been in there. First meeting was, right, who do we want to try and get? And all of us, I wanted Rangers, obviously, whether that was realistic who was the no, but yeah. everyone thought, yeah, that would be brilliant if we could pull that off. It would be fantastic. And obviously with the clubs having a good relationship, um, our chairman now, who was the secretary of my committee, Roy McGivern, um, started to make contact um, with Andrew Dixon, it was. Yes, yes. And so... George, just back and forth, back and forth. And obviously, in between time, I was having events, golf days, and golf day, and, and had a dinner. Had Jeff Winter over for my dinner. That's right. To speak. He was fantastic, big Rangers man as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah. George, he was brilliant, really, really good. Um, and then we had uh, an opportunity that came up out of the blue. I'll never forget it. I was driving to the coach that we football team had to take and Roy had phoned me to say, look, Rangers have come back, got to us, um, they want to come over, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, flip. It was quite <laughs> surreal. I was sort of like, geez, is this actually happening? Yeah, yeah. And there was a wee bit of a, que there was a question mark with us because we were supposed to play Cliftonville, George, but... Then the opportunity arose because Roy Carroll played for us that he was going to be called in the Northern Ireland team again. And we had Paul Smith, who was with us, who's with actually Leighton Orient now, was involved in like the Northern Ireland under-21s and stuff. Mm. So the rule is, if you have two internationals away, you can call the game off. Right, okay. And, and especially since it's a specialist position, which was a goalkeeper. So then we had to wait for that to happen. Um, to try and get a bit of inside information, a bit of news of whether Roy was going to be called up and whatever else. So to be fair, Cliftonville ar ar agreed then, look, that's the game, stop, which meant then we could accelerate then getting Rangers over. Um, and we had, what, it was like three weeks or something to plan it, George. Um, probably if we had longer, there would have been a full house. Yeah. But we ended up, I'm near sure, with three weeks planning. I think we had about 9,800 there. Which, again, you know, Rangers brought over a full team. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they, they were preparing for the old firm then, the That's Celtic right. match. Mm. And came over to play us. It was Sanderos. That was his first match, was That's against right. us, George. <laughs> Well, even, I, I mean, I, yeah, well, to be fair, I mean, I think the only player playing from that team is actually James Tavernier, isn't that right? I think he was actually, he was playing that day as well. And he's the only player from yeah. that game to actually still be in the squad at the minute. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, that's probably right, George, yeah, mm -hmm. it would be. Kenny Miller was phenomenal that day. Yeah. He was so probably he Kenny Miller was probably about fifty five years of age by then. Anyway, you see, he keeps he just keeps to keep going. He keep going. The guy was the guy was fantastic. Cranshaw scored an absolute worldie, an absolute. <laughs> and um, Joey Barton was playing, but Kenny Miller was. Do you know he came on and played, and he never done it at Rangers, and he came on and he was brilliant. Was O'Halloran? Michael O'Halloran, yeah. 
even before Rangers signed him, I always liked him. And then he came to Rangers, and it was just like Pfft. he's a different player. Yeah. yeah. And then he actually came on against us, and a lot of our boys commented about him. But Kenny Miller was was fantastic. Mm-hmm. He really was. Did you uh, but, did you find yourself cheering at any goals? <laughs> what did the game they win first game? <laughs> well, I think it was five and all by half time, wasn't it? If I'm right. Oh my god, yeah. Look from from an unselfish point of view, George, I was just really, really, really disappointed in the result because Rangers might in the future then if we want the Rangers to come over and play us again, they might go beat them seven. There's no point. We're not yeah. going to get anything out of it. Do you know, that was the most disappointing thing for me. Um, but look, for, from me, from a selfish point of view of getting a, full, a Rangers team over and playing their first 11, um, from my testimony, it was, was, was fantastic. And obviously, mm. the, you know, always supported Rangers and obviously supported Linfield and playing and being able to play, you know, for my testimony, whatever it was, it was quite surreal. Well, I think if if you keep going the way you're going now, you might even get a second testimonial, and you'll probably get another match against them. So you never know. Well, another kid here, with another kid coming along and going home, mate. But speak, speaking of kids, I've got one of your. I've got a wee question from one of your uh, one of your one of your uh, coach kids, um, young Harry uh-huh. Black. Um, who uh-huh. you know. And young Harry wants to know what's been your biggest achievement at Linfield. Hard question. Yeah, look, I've had so many great memories, George. Honestly, um, and look, whenever I first walked in the door, you would I would never have imagined of of it, you know, to, to turn out this way. To be honest with you. Um, but I think, you know, and it's the same if you want to do anything in life. And I think, you know, at Linfield and certainly the same at Rangers as well, that if you want to be successful, I think you have to give your life to it. Um, mm. You have to be you have to be all in, really. Um, there's no cutting corners because you will go find out and you'll, you'll, you'll end up falling short. Um, and certainly over the 16 years, that's what, that's what I've certainly done, dedicated my life to the playing football and, not, and more importantly playing playing for Linfield. Um my family would, would, would tell you that. Uh but <clears throat> look, there's been so many, you know, fantastic moments to to over the years of playing with so many great players, but but more importantly, George, great teammates and great fellas. Mm-hmm. Um and obviously, you know, you have great memories of, of, of playing, but you have also great memories of the times that, that you shared together, you know, in the changing rooms, trips away and, and, and all those things. And then you do yeah, making friendships, you know, for life. Mm. Um, I suppose that's, look, that's the, the most gratifying and, and, you know, thing that, that you do share, share all those great memories with, with you know f- fantastic teammates and yeah. obviously you wouldn't be successful you wouldn't be as successful you know without them and obviously you know it's it's been fantastic over the years to do that um and obviously look at did have a goal um you know from a from my own point of view and, and from a from a personal accolade that he always had a goal of of wanting to get you know the the football writers of the year and the Ulster football of the year. Um, mm. That's obviously, obviously, along with international caps and international appearances. That's you know from a from a personal point of view and from a person for you know an accolade you know to to win personally was was those ones and and obviously was 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 able to do that um, a number of years ago. And that's as I say, that was very satisfying. And again, you don't win. Them awards, um, George, without the, the the people that you know that you have around you, um, yeah. and obviously, look, I've been so successful at Linfield, um, because of of all those people that that, that you have around you and, and that you share a pitch and changing room with. 
Mm. And and saying that, obviously, you you have had a fantastic career. I didn't even get the I didn't even bypass the fact that you even had international honours as well for an Irish league player to represent your country at that level, and it is a fantastic achievement in itself. So even just going back to that wee bit, Jimmy, what was that like? What was it like being called into the international squad? You know, what, what, it must have been phenomenal. And obviously, you're at that stage you were primarily in a part time league as a part time player, but coming into that full time environment and being treated like a professional, it must have been it must have been an unreal experience. No, it was George, and look, we were going away on a on a tour. We went to America, to Connecticut, to play Turkey, and then we went on out to Chile then to play Chile. Um, and look, on a on a on a normal international break, um, there wouldn't be so many Irish league players called up and and and, and all those things, but because of the the, the time of year um, that these friendlies were coming up, that the opportunity rose for Nigel Worthen to to call up a number of players from our league, and as I say, look, I knew it was only possibly it was only going to be a one one chance at it. Um, and as I say, look, in an ideal international break or ideal international game friendly that that I wouldn't have been looked at. So here, I'm honest and open enough to, to know that, but it's a uh, it's an opportunity that that I really, really enjoyed, um, and I played every single minute of both games. Um, so must have must have done reasonably well. And look, no one can take that away away from from me or anybody else now. Um, that got that opportunity to play twice, and you know it was a fantastic experience, and really, really enjoyed it. And again, that you know you you play football to. For, for the memories and, and for those moments and it was another one that was was absolutely brilliant fantastic and i mean again I, I, we've already touched on the fact that you've had such a long and illustrious career and we hope that you can continue to go on in that but over that time frame who, who do you who do you think you know and considering all those international games and even champions league games and even how close slimfield came even a few years ago to reaching those, those actual group stages who's the best player that you have come up against Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> There's been so many. Um, believe it or not, George, we whenever we played against, um, whenever we played against Celtic, I would have said Tom Rogic was the best. Really? Yeah. And a lot of our boys would have said that, George, to be honest with you. Um, and obviously, look, I'm a big Rangers fan, and so is Matty Clark on our squad. He obviously used to play for Rangers as well in the academy and stuff. But Tom Rogic was, 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 would have been one of the best. From, from my memory, anyway, would have been one of the best. From a recent memory, um, he, he was good. George was good. And that yeah. was whenever Celtic were done. The Brendan Rodgers, you know, they were top five side then, like. Um, but he would have been, you know, top. And Turkey played against um, centre mid was used to play for Newcastle. Now was Emre. Yes, yes, that's right. Small centre midfielder. Better he played. Um, it was good. They had the goalkeeper who used to have the black stuff across the below the yeah, eyes. That's right. He was at Barcelona as well. Yes. And then they had the striker. Who was he at Stoke at one stage? I think. Can't remember his name, but Turkey had a really good side out, and then we played Chile, and they were we were playing them in a friendly preparing for the World Cup. Mm. And I'm near sure who else was the manager then. So he was with Leeds now. I would uh, I would love to see yeah. your. Uh... Jimmy, you'll have to send us a photograph of your uh, your kits, all the kits you've collected over the years. I'm sure they're phenomenal. I'm sure you've got some crackers as well. Do you know I have kits, right, George? And I don't have... They sit in a box. I have a box. <laughs> I, have a few, I, have a, I have a few framed, um, but the wife wouldn't really have them framed. No, up no. The house. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have three kids here come the end of October, so I don't have a spare room to, 
for myself. <laughs> a man kid. Yeah, well, that's that's the next thing that I'll have to get, but yeah, it's getting room for that as well. So, um, yeah. no, but look, again, that's, you know, you collect these things for, for memories and for further down the line whenever you finish playing and that you can look back on and have those memories of, you know, you pull the shirt out and you remember this and you remember that. Um, and again, that's that's what we're all, that's that's what you play for. So, Jamie, obviously coming to the end of things, and, and again, we're not we're not trying to write you off before you're finished, but you are reaching that that you're in your mid thirties now. What what does the future hold? I know you've started looking at your coaching. We hope to see you keep playing for obviously as long as possible. But you know, what do you do? We just keep playing. Do you keep going until the legs say no? You can't do it. You you know, because six hundred games, nine league titles, it's a phenomenal achievement. But we do. I mean, realistically, the, the, and you've continued some good form over the last couple of years. There's no doubt that you can continue doing that for another few years, at least. Anyway, no. Look, obviously, probably George injuries the Tate. Yeah. You know the 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 length of time. Um, I certainly feel as fit as ever um, I don't think I'm slowing down anyway um, <laughs> no one's told me I'm slowing down um, as I say in training we, we do our training and there's no issues and continue to cover the you know the high the high distances you know during matches and stuff so as I say I feel good touch wood over my career I haven't had anything major um, and as long as Limfield want me, then I'll continue to to play, and hopefully that is for for another few years anyway. But look, have my coaching badges there, George. Um, you know the club have spoken to me about doing, you know, coaching and and things like that. Um, have a good relationship with the manager, so um, that's something I think that that he wants me to do as well. So. That would be a, a perfect pathway for me and it would be something I'd be very keen to do. Um, you know, you see people that finish for, finish playing football and then they, they don't want to be involved in it, but I like to I would like to be involved in it and certainly be involved with with Limfield and um the, the coaching aspect and the coaching side of it along with say, you know, with, with, with David and Ross, that would be perfect for me. It would really that would certainly motivate me and it would certainly wet, wet me up with height and, and be something that I would, that I would want and, and, and enjoy. Um, you were just finishing off there, obviously saying that you're, you're potentially, you know, you're looking at coaching, you've done your coaching badges and obviously is that something that you see yourself going into in the future? Does management then come into the equation or is it is it obviously with the wealth of experience that you've gathered for all those years and the values that you said you've, you've developed early on in your career, it'd, it'd be fantastic for you to obviously pass those on. So what does what does Jamie McGrew the future hold? Um, the coaching, George, as I say, look, um, it's something that look, I want to stay in the game, uh, enjoy the coaching part of it, and look, obviously, if obviously, look, David has sort of mentioned about doing a bit of coaching, you know, along with him and Ross and things um, down the line. So again, that would motivate me, and that's. I would be very, very happy and, and would love to do that. Um, managing side, don't know, George. Um, <laughs> it's difficult when you're still playing, obviously, isn't it? David Healy might have something to say about that. Yeah, so. look, to be honest with you, George, look, as I say, I really enjoy the coaching. Um, David seems to think that that will be the manager. He's already said that publicly. Um but it's one of them ones, George, that, you know, hopefully in a long time down the line, because obviously I enjoy, you know, playing mm. under David at the minute. Um, and as I say, look, hopefully that continues. And even, you know, whenever I finish playing, that hopefully that continues because um, he is doing a fantastic job. Um, but further down the line, if the job comes available and it's, and it's at the right time, and then feel feel that I'm the one to do it. Then how how can you turn it down, George, if it ever comes yeah. about? And that, that's what I would. That's the way I would certainly feel about it. But look, from a coaching aspect, it would be the the whole um, 
excitement and buzz. Um, if it was, for example, if I was involved coaching with the first team, um, that would give me that real buzz. The the like obviously there's nothing like playing, but it would be a great substitute for you know for not playing um, mm. and and to be involved in the environment and and getting the buzz and the excitement from the, the competitors of it. Excellent. So, Jamie, obviously, I want to thank you loads. You've, you've obviously given up your time, and I appreciate that. But one final question. We've got Rangers entering a new season. Uh, again, pretty much similar to Linfield. The, the, the pressures are there. The expectations are as well. But what player for you do you think this year um, could really stand out for Rangers? What player do you could you could make a, a big impact for us this year? I think George, obviously, <clears throat> I don't think I can get all... I think everyone's maybe getting a wee bit edgy over the start of the over mm. the, the season you near know, the start of the pad. Um certainly obviously after the, the, the Malmo game, certainly at home, I think that was a big shock for us all. Yeah. But I think what I think what we all have to realise now is George that the Rangers are back on the map. Um yeah. Everyone, everyone knows who we are now again, and um, we're a we're, we're a force now. Um, and obviously, look the results that we had over the pa- over over the past couple of years in the Europa League. And mm. um, I think teams take take Rangers and take us very seriously now. Um, and obviously, look we've seen that with Malmo, but you know that. I think no matter where Rangers go, um, that whether it's outside of Scotland, that everyone still wants to beat you. And I think yeah. obviously we've seen that with Manu as well. Um, but I think, you know, I think we'll have to be patient. There's obviously with the whole COVID thing now, um, George, that, you know, obviously a lot of it's kept in house, but, you know, players that have had COVID will get COVID, um, which means then there'll be a different. Different levels of fitness. Um, obviously, boys away with the Euros, they've had to have a break, and again, different levels of fitness. So, I think it's important that you know we all have patience and let you know Rangers eventually get back into the groove again, which I think they will. Mm. Um, but I do think I think obviously the difference we've seen that Morelos made against. Malmo George with his performance that night. I think that yeah, there for everybody to see that that he is a big, big player for Rangers. Um, he's still, you know, he's the one that's that's going to make things happen and and, and yeah. do the goals. Um, and then I think whenever he, I think you see a difference in the team, George, that whenever Ryan Kent's not performing, mm. um, because I think he can provide that that X factor, that something different, that bit of magic. Um, he has the ability of obviously taking players on and, and as I say, providing that bit of magic. Um, and again, look, he's not in form either, but, you know, every player goes through a, a dip in form and I think there's no doubt that, that, that he'll get back to, that, to those levels again. Um, and as I say, look, I said there about obviously the whole different, you know, levels of fitness, you know, Morelos is just back as well. So, mm. again, um, I think, as I say, once they... Get back up to those levels of fitness that you know they'll be. I think we'll be back on form again and and, and ready to go again. Um, and obviously you've got the the old firm game coming around the corner, which again is is a massive game to to sort of stamp your authority um, in the league and and again put down a marker um, to say that you know that we're still number one and you're still you're still you know a bit a bit to go to catch us. Absolutely. So, Jamie, as we're recording this, we are about an hour away from kickoff in our game against Alice Alice Skirt, who um, we actually done a preview pod last night for the for the Battle Fever pod. And uh, so, I know I'm I'm not going to even attempt you into saying what you know about Alice Skirt from Armenia. But can we get a quick score prediction from you? What you think for tonight? Well, we were actually we were the if we had got through that last round, George, we were to play the losers. Okay. We were to play. We would be due. No, yeah, we would have. The, we would have. We were supposed to play one of the teams, right? So, but look, you would expect George that Rangers will be fine. Um, 
and you would hope that then an ideal result would be a clean sheet um, for Rangers. Uh, you know, you'd hope maybe at least two now anyway, George, to give you a bit of comfort tonight there. Um, but I think, you know, obviously a clean sheet's important. Um, yeah. Obviously our, our defensive record hasn't been good over the past few matches. Obviously we started off well against Livingston, but after that we haven't done so um, since then. So I think, you know, confidence-wise and, and to, to really put us in good shape going, going out there, I think, you know, at least 2-0 would, would be perfect. So we're, we're hoping for a, a joint 56 celebration at the end of the season then, basically, yeah? Fingers crossed. <laughs> be quite, well, listen. Uh, be quite mag magic. Magic. Well, Jimmy, listen, um, uh, thanks again. Um, I've, I've probably said thanks about 100 times to you for this, but I really do appreciate you giving up your time. Um, I know you're obviously very busy. You've got two young kids. You're doing the coaching thing. And from a from a personal point of view and from the poet's point of view, we absolutely wish you the best of success um, professionally and personally. I know, obviously, you're moving into the coaching thing and, and you do a lot of coaching as well. And again, from from mutual friends that they've, they've talked about how great it is and, and obviously that experience that you're passing on to the young kids and the impact that you're making on them so um again thanks very much mate i'm um, hope to have you on in the future and hopefully um if we do get a, a joint 56 we'll get you on for a wee tent and celebration on that there absolutely thanks very much and thank you for asking me on thank you really appreciate thanks, it thanks jimmy thanks buddy take care thank you cheerio bye